HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. HeritageRadioNetwork.org is dedicated to providing the most up-to-date information and news on the food industry. Interviews with chefs and in-depth pieces on food systems take listeners literally from the farm to the fork. Can you hear this anywhere else? Nope. Press the donate button on our website and learn how you can become a founding member and support the station. Broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn, you're listening to HeritageRadioNetwork.org. All right, you have tuned into the Heritage Radio Network. You're listening to The Farm Report, and I am your host, Aaron Fairbanks. We have a full house in studio today, and I think things are going to get a little wild. Um, we have a couple of authors in-house. We're talking to Matt Weingarten and Rachel Pazell. Yeah, Did Raquel. I say that right? Raquel. Raquel. All right. (laughs) Start over. No, I'm just kidding. Um, And uh, Jackson Landers. Um, So we're talking about Rachel Matt. Your book is Preserving Wild Foods, a modern forager's recipes for curing, canning, smoking and pickling. And Jackson, your very provocative title, Eating Aliens, One Man's Adventure Hunting Invasive Animal Species. So both of these books really talk about engaging with the natural environment in a, a pretty unique way. And so I wanted to kind of kick us off by getting a little bit better understanding as you guys were looking um, to approach this book and kind of delve into these topics, what kind of definitions you were using um, yourself. So Jackson, I want to start with you. Um, In the U.S., I mean, how exactly do you define an an invasive species? My definition of an invasive species would be something that has been uh, brought from its native habitat um, uh, through some type of human activity uh, and it's been brought into a new habitat where it is increasing in its numbers and its range uh, that that would be my my definition of an invasive species and then it, beyond that you know there's a question of whether it's doing harm or not I think it's possible to have an invasive species that, that ends up fitting in its new habitat well but that's probably the the exception yeah I think it's like one of those things that's always interesting looking at the US and kind of the age of our country and history, it's like some things that have been brought in uh, have had positive and others have had negative impacts. Like your book covers some species I've never heard of, black spiny-tailed iguanas, green iguanas, Chinese mystery snails. I mean, of the kind of plethora of species to choose from, how did you kind of narrow down the list? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Um, cause there, were, there were a couple uh, criteria I looked at. I wanted to go after invasive species that I thought, in the first place, things that I think I- I thought I had a reasonable chance of getting people to actually eat. I mean, I don't want it to just be like, "Ooh, look at this guy eating the gross bugs," you know, which might be entertaining. But I want I wanted to look for things that might people might actually emulate. That was one thing, and another thing was I didn't want to hunt any any invasive species in a place where it was being managed as a game animal. Uh, you know, for example, brown trout is native to Europe and it's stocked in streams all over the place. But if I buy a trout trout stamp on my fishing license and go catch brown trout, then 
what I'm actually doing is paying to have more of them stocked. So there were a lot of interesting invasive things that I would have liked to include in the book, but it would have actually been counterproductive to what I'm trying to do in terms of removal. And of course, the other thing was budget. You know, um, it had to be things that I could get within a reasonable amount of time without having to sit out there, you know, for maybe two, three, four weeks trying to get something, you know, and, and kind of running out of money. So it had to be things I could usually get within like a week or two on the road. And when you mean get, you mean the actual I kind mean of hunting and, and capture. butcher and eat, yes. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Got it. And then how about for you guys, um, wild foods? I mean, what, what does that mean? Uh, yeah, so wild foods, um, more, more and more in our society, um, you know, there are not so many wild foods. And, and some, some of that it has to do with uh, what we recognize as, as foods themselves. So a lot, of the, a lot of the recipes in the books and a lot of the, the – uh, um, the ingredients are things that we ordinarily walk past, such as dandelions or, um, you know, mulberries that are, you know, in New York City, in our environment here in Brooklyn, um, they're everywhere and nobody thinks of them as food stuff. So, uh, but for me, those are, those are wild. They, are, they, they live, you know, sometimes they're on, you know, they're hanging over someone's, someone's lawn, um, you know, over the sidewalk. But for me, uh, in my environment, they, they, they are wild. And, you know, again, I also wanted the book to not be, um, uh, things that were so difficult to forge and to identify um, that it was really sort of a, a you know a trail guide um, for for you know very specific botanical information. These are all things that everybody can find, everybody can get access to, and uh, the recipes are accessible, and uh, you can go out and find something in nature and and put it up and and make some delicious. Yeah, so one of the interesting things from the the intro to the book, you talk about the Union Square Green Market, really. Because you're a city dweller, often kind of acting as your kind of ad hoc grocery store for wild goods. And I know I was uh, back in Michigan a couple of years ago and out of my grandpa's field and I saw this purslane everywhere in the middle of the rows kind of muddying things up. And I picked a bunch of it and I went inside and I was like, oh, grandpa, like... You know what they're getting for New York City? You know, in New York City, they're charging like six bucks a pound for this. And he's like, well, you know, you can have as much as you want and I'll be happy to ship it your way. But um, I think there is something that both of you guys touch on where this kind of recognition of things as as edible or non edible um, food stuff. And I'm just curious if you, you can comment on kind of how um, how we, in your experience things have kind of trended in or trended out um, with regards to stuff like purslane or different you know breeds of fish or bugs so like in your book you talk about lobster being you know historically kind of the, this food um, that that nobody would eat unless you were super poor and and then now lobster is kind of a, a luxury item so how do we work to kind of control some of those things yeah there were um, with the lobster actually there were indentured servants would have it and even would have it in their contracts in New England that they couldn't be fed lobster more than like two or three days a week you know they wanted to, to limit that but we changed our minds about it you know it became uh, it became a luxury item and a lobster that's a pretty strange thing and when you stop and take a look it looks like this big you know bug with all these legs and claws and everything and we put that in our mouths you know there's stuff that's not quite that challenging at all that's out there that tastes perfectly good that um that, that I, I think a lot of, more of us should be incorporating into our diets. You know, I think um, eating an iguana, that's a lot less weird than eating this big, creepy alien insect thing from, from out of the ocean. Uh, so I think it's a, just, it's a question of expanding our, our horizons and, and eating new things. And, and it's a way of, um, for, for, the, for hunters and fishermen, it's a way of participating in the ecosystem, really. And I think that's something that, you know, both Matt and I, what our books are kind of getting at, I mean, among other things is go out in the wild participate in this in this ecosystem instead of just being a spectator yeah i mean what what do you guys think i mean who's driving these kind of trends because i know matt like your wife is from slovakia and there's a long history there and her family you know from stories that you've told really has interacted with the natural environment for centuries but now when we're kind of in this place where people have stopped that relationship kind of how do we restart it yeah I, i think you know i mean i I really think it's sort of a, a progression of sort of the, the a little bit of the local war seasonal uh, movement um, that as you're you know as you really want I mean for me personally as as, uh, as I'm wanting to support my local farmers this time of year or you know maybe two weeks ago three weeks ago um, the sun is out and everybody's at the green market and you know what the earth is still you know rock cold and none of the none of the none of the uh, sort of cultiv- cultivated shoots are up and so you know just like you're uh, 
your grandfather in uh, uh, Michigan, um, purslane's growing in the field. There's you know lambs quarters growing in the field. There's cattails growing in the field, and you know smart farmers have, are really have been have been one of the key um, you know. Uh, supporters of, of bringing these into you know the public awareness. I mean, there's you know in the foraging world. I mean, I think with with uh, you know Noma Restaurant and, and Renee Ritzep and all the great work he's doing, and, and lots of other chefs that have sort of brought this kind of idea of you know eating from the landscape and eating what's around, and uh, you know it should be more common knowledge. Um, One of my favorite stories um, that Matt tells in the book is about uh, cattails and how they're really one of the first wild edibles that he could safely identify and he knew to pick and he could do something with them and then he was at the uh, the green market in union square one day and one of his favorite farmers was there selling wild hearts of palm which was just cattails (laughs) but it's a perfect example of how you know just some slick um sales could really send something that people might be like cattails really into something like oh it's wild hearts of palm i know what i could do with that right and in the book we pickle them and they're totally delicious it's like rose by any other name exactly (laughs) what about i mean is there any concern about competing with the existing food supply i mean i think you guys it's it's an it touch on it in different ways i mean Jackson, in your book, you talk about um, different types of uh, harvesting or control mechanisms for invasive species where, mm-hmm. um, you know, people issue license or they put a bounty out and kind of how um, those things have or haven't worked. And so I'm just curious, I mean, is there uh, a point where things are a, a threat? So like, is the spiny-tailed iguana ever going to, like, be competing with the chicken in a way that we should be concerned about? You mean or? economically? Yeah. Which, no, no. That, that's, I mean, that's not going to happen. It doesn't need to, to compete with the chicken on that scale to have, you know, an ecological impact in terms of, of getting, of improvement. Um, I think there's a real tendency, unfortunately, for people to look at a lot of the movements going on in food for the last decade or so in a sort of an all or nothing, you know, light. I mean, I've seen, you know, op-eds, op-ed pieces, you know, ripping into the local form movement saying, well, this isn't economically good because it's isolationist and all that sort of thing. And, you know, the local food movement isn't about saying everyone eats this way. If you have like 10% of the population say, yeah, we're going to try to eat local food, you know, that's enough to have a local food economy and to have some farmers that are making, you know, that, that, that are making a living locally and to keep some heritage breeds and uh, alive. It, everyone doesn't have to be doing something in order for it to be successful. You know, it's okay for something to be kind of a niche that moves along and has its own effect. And I see that with, um, you know, with invasive species also. We're not, no one's ever going to be eating enough black spiny tail iguanas, you know, to compete with Purdue, but we don't need that to happen to get them off of Gasparilla Island and, and rescue that ecosystem. And and how about for you guys? I mean, is there a responsibility that we have with regards to, to foraging? I mean, is the ramp population going to be threatened at any point? Or is that so far down the line that, like, you know, what are what concerns do we have to have about about foraging or, or choosing things and how much to take and from where and when? and? Yeah, I, I actually don't think we're possibly that far away from having a, a ramp situation, if you will. <laughs> um, I think that's a great example. Um, so there is some danger in it, for, you know, Part of it is, um, you know, the, the idea of competition is good. I mean, the, the whole idea is to diversify what we eat. I mean, I think that is the that is the key to any healthy system is diversity, 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 diversity. So if ramp becomes a you know a commodity product, if you will, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have some issues. The idea of the uh, uh, as much as I rely on farmers, the idea of the book is um, to get people to get out in the ecosystem themselves. And I find that you know if you see it growing yourself. You're, you tend to be a lot more responsible. You tend to understand the rhythms of it. Maybe you take a lot one year and you boost, and you say, "Oh wow, you know what? There's not so many this year. Maybe I should maybe I should leave more." I think I think our own you know I think that the separation of sort of um, our food sources is is what causes a lot of our uh, 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 you know a lot of our uh, irresponsibility. Um, uh, yeah. No. I'm I'm just I'm curious. Like I I, I think there is like you see it so much across the food system that if something is kind of hot or hitting, then it gets co-opted by, you know, big egg or, or 
you know, I had um, Sandor Katz on the show yesterday talking about fermentation, and I'm like, well, what's the deal with probiotic yogurt that Jamie Lee Curtis is slinging? Like, is that, you know, how how do those two worlds kind of interact? So I think it's always something just to be, I don't know, sensitive to. Um, well, you know, if cattails got huge as something where like there was that much demand for them, then you'd have people f- figuring out ways to cultivate them. You know, and the same thing would probably happen with wild ramps at some point if they got that huge. I think before we ran out of them in the wild, you'd have farmers saying it's more cost effective to, you know, to to call, and which sort of defeats the whole idea of the, you know, what what um, Matt and I, you know, advocate in terms of eating from the wild. But I think that's probably how the the free market would sort that out. And and certainly in, in hunting, we've had to confront this in the past. When you something gets scarce, they they have bag limits. They say, well, we don't have enough of this duck, so you can only take one or two per season, and that's it. And so they would maybe do that with ramps. Say, okay, you can take half a pound or two pounds or something instead of it just being free for all. We have ways of dealing with it. Yeah, and sure. I mean, that's also kind of where I think things come in at a policy level, where you have the DNR or the USDA kind of looking to put controls. And like another thing to think about, especially I think for urban consumers, is it's another way to kind of voice your muscle on like what's happening in the food supply. I think, you know, it's one thing to walk along the streets of New York or head out into a country field and and pick some dandelions or or, or chicory or do a little bit of foraging for morels. It's an entirely different thing to, you know, strap on a a gun or or put together a fishing pole and and head out kind of, quote unquote, into the wild to try and and do some hunting. Now, Jack, I know you have another book where you talk about um, introducing people to deer hunting. And I mean, what would you say for, for somebody who's interested in kind of first steps into this world of 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 hunting or fishing yeah hunting for food um you know broadly speaking depending on what you're going to go after you know my advice is uh become a student of the animal learn everything you can about the, uh, that animal's life and what motivates it at, d- at different times and then um practice with your weapon whether it's a it's a bow or a rifle or a shotgun or a pistol become proficient and safe with it and um and, and and get a hunting license and those three things you're going to be successful after a while with regard to deer i mean that's it's the most bang for your buck i mean it's a lot of food with with one deer and it's pretty um they're they're pretty uh free with uh, with li- with licenses for them and they really don't cost very much uh yeah my book uh, my first book a big uh the beginner's guide to hunting deer for food you know it will get you from zero to 60 pretty quickly you still have to take a um, a free class from the state for uh, a hunter safety course uh and there's lots of public land out there i mean you can get a good deer rifle for you know used for as little as 250 300 dollars you know maybe 50 bucks or so for your hunting license and you're in business and that you can hunt with that rifle probably for the rest of your life uh you know if you're going to get 40 50 pounds of meat out of each deer you know you figure you wouldn't pay maybe 10 bucks a pound at the uh the grocery store for um for you know good meat like that and it pays for itself pretty quickly uh, i've had a lot of students in my i've taught deer, deer hunting classes for years and i've had students come down from manhattan and washington DC people who've been sitting in front of computer screens their whole lives and they've been who've been successful as hunters and they're really you know they're not buying factory farmed meat anymore uh, it really does work even if you're an adult beginner yeah I was gonna say I still get you know once or twice a year the styrofoam box from my dad up in northern Michigan filled with venison and bear meat which mm-hmm. is always kind of a treat to invite people over and have a wild game dinner here in the city um so on an individual or personal level, it seems like there's kind of easy entree to engaging with the ecosystem or the wild world. And I'm wondering, Matt, you know, your experience as a, a New York City restaurant chef, how, how does that change using these products in a, in a professional kitchen? Um, it's kind of the job of making the food delicious. Um, and so... Um, Everybody gets some familiarity with it, and you you, you kind of become a, a you know a spokesperson for cattails, you know, or a spokesperson for you know uh, dandelion jelly or what what have you. Um, I, I kind of I kind of like having that uh, like having that role. I really enjoy um, turning people onto something delicious, and um, and honestly taking taking the chefiness out of it in, in, in some sense. I mean, all the recipes uh, and and one of my uh, you know you know basic philosophies is that. Um, uh, food should always be delicious, and it should always be accessible and easy to make delicious food. And so, the recipes are very uncomplicated. I mean, the the most complex we get is making some you know dry cured sausages, which is very sort of like, oh, I can't do that. But you know what? You can do that. First, learn how to make some sausages, and then you know uh, uh, these are natural processes that you know um, 
hundreds of years, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, everybody knew how to make. I, I kind of challenge everybody to say that, you know, either your grandfather or your grandfather's grandfather was making some form of naturally cured meat. And now in today's society, we've kind of lost that knowledge. So hopefully part of the book is, 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 is exciting people to, uh, to, to get back to that way of living, um, not uh, every day, but um, to do it as an occasion. And, and everybody enjoys, you know, I, I, was, I was telling somebody the other day, I've never asked uh, friends of mine that are not chefs or n- not, not working in professionally in the food field if they want to come over and, you know, put up some sausage with me. Nobody's always like, oh, I don't want to do that. It's always like, oh, yeah, yeah, can I come? Can I bring a friend? Um, yeah. People are really excited about it. So it's, it's, it's great to, uh, you know, s- spread the love. What about, and, and this is a question for everyone, what about other kind of barriers to, to entry as far as getting into uh, a restaurant or a retail market for some of these goods? I know, you know, historically, it's like you could knock on the back door of a kitchen and say, hey, I've got this, you know, saddle of venison or basket of berries. Do you want to buy it? But are, are there other kind of restrictions in place or changes that you think might make sense? Um, from a, a policy perspective to increase kind of chef's access or consumer's access to these goods? I'd say that, I mean, the issue there is mostly uh, uh, with regard to wild game. Uh, if you shoot a, uh, a deer and butcher it and, and take the meat home, uh, it is uh, illegal to sell it. Uh, from a, meat from a wild deer, and that's true of a lot of wild game. Uh, fish, you know, it's a little bit different. Um, you, you, there's more uh, commercial. It's simpler to get uh, commercial licensing to sell wild fish. Um, there, there are some openings now for selling wild meat, and I think we need to see more. There's a, a pretty good uh, trade going on uh, in Louisiana in Nutria, which is this big aquatic rodent. It looks sort of like a, like imagine a beaver with like a, a tail, like a muskrat or like a rat, you know. Um, it, they're, um, they, they taste like chicken and the texture is like chicken also. And um, they're shooting those in the wild and they've, they've gotten around some of the, the legal problems that were there a few decades ago. They're selling the meat and it's really become part of Cajun cuisine down there. Um, so that can happen. Uh, I think we need to see some changes with regard to feral pigs as far as that's concerned um, because you can't sell the, that pork if it was, um, you know, if you, you harvest it in the wild, if you shoot it. Um, it's USDA won't allow it. But I don't think it really makes a lot of sense because you look in, in Europe, um, you know, it, wild game is sold in butcher shops. It's served in restaurants where it is, you know, it is uh, slaughtered in the wild, where it's shot in the wild, then very quickly, you know, quartered, butchered, transported, and refrigerated. And they've been doing this all along, and nobody's getting sick. You're not having E. coli breakouts. There's, not a, there's clearly not a health risk. They're doing this all over Europe and the UK. So I think we could, I think we could loosen up some of those restrictions and start start getting rid of some some feral pigs i mean i think i've heard uh, wild pigs outnumber humans in texas now you know i mean we i and there are talented pig hunters there are people who you know who are very good at taking these things out i hunted in georgia with this uh 19 year old kid who'd taken i think something like 60 um pigs off this farm in the last year you know and and meanwhile you know i've i talked to a usda scientist at a uh, uh wildlife reserve um where, where his program he'd put together and they spent a lot of money on this they'd taken out something like 16 in the last year you know this kid who just like you know in like at at night you know and then he's he's out there hunting you know until dawn and then he sleeps for half an hour and goes to work was doing a better job if you could give those kids those guys um, you know, a good price per pound where they could sell that, that pig meat, you would be getting rid of a lot more of these uh, the invasive pigs. Awesome. I think we are going to take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, I want to tuck into the world of garum.
right, we are back. We are talking uh, eating animals and wild foods. And be- before the break, we were uh, going to tuck into garum. And, and Jackson, in your book, you, you kind of make this really interesting point about kind of what we choose to eat is a, a matter of perspective and tradition rather than an informed judgment based on, on what something tastes like. And Matt, when I was kind of flipping through your recipes, garum seems to be like this really obvious um, anomaly, anomaly because I mean, maybe you can tell us a little bit like what that is and why some people might think that's a weird thing to eat even though uh, it's delicious. <laughs> yeah, it, that's funny. Um, it is delicious. Um, and It's homemade uh, fish sauce. Yeah, it's homemade fish sauce. I mean, that, yeah. that, that, that's the amazing part. I mean, it is historically one of the um, one of the easiest most accessible uh, foodstuffs that um, you know modern civilization has uh, has lived up lived up a garm is, is the uh, a- ancient Roman name for it and it's basically you get a bunch of small tiny sardines um, you take off the uh, flesh you eat it then or you cure it or, or what have you and you have what you have left is, is bones and guts and, and, and the head um, and if you uh, put those in a barrel and put some salt on it, and just sort of let it do its do its thing. Let it let the microorganisms work on that flesh. Um, uh, you pull out all the minerality from it, and you get what ends up being a very mellow um, sort of a nampla or, or fish sauce type tasting uh, condiment. And uh, you know, in Roman times, I mean, you look back at Apicius. I mean, everything has garum or liquam in it, and uh, that was the you know it was the soy sauce of the day. Um, it was the main condiment for. For making any any various numbers of dressings, and the reason why it was so successful is because um, people that ate it um, stayed healthier longer because they were um, accessing otherwise inaccessible vitamins and minerals that that in today's society is like oh that's the fish guts I'm throwing those out. Um, so uh, I just try to want to recreate it. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's like I mean, really, what you're talking about is putting a bunch of fish guts and bones and heads into a, a vat and letting them. Yeah, Ferment, that, I mean right? that, that's exactly what you're doing. I mean, it's a natural fermentation. You're taking the bones and the guts and the heads of fish. You're covering them with a uh, percentage of salt. I put uh, some pineapple juice in mine, which I don't think was a uh, was a Roman mm-hmm. technique, but uh, it, uh, pineapple juice is uh, kind of comes from the uh, sort of a southeastern uh, Asian uh, modern repertoire. Uh, the enzymes help uh, break down uh, proteins, um, so it, it just um, sort of. It's a little bit of an insurance policy. It also gives a little bit of sweetness and, and roundness to the uh, uh, end all product, and that's it. And we leave it for you know, uh, you know, three months. If you get through the first uh, three weeks of, of sort of the odiferous nature of it, um, it's smooth sailing and it mellows out nicely. And there's nothing cooler <laughs> than having people over for dinner and pulling out homemade fish sauce that you made. <laughs> like, and you tell people this is my homemade fish sauce and watch their eyes pop out of their head, and it's amazing. Yeah, it's um, like a little you know secret superpower. Yeah. Right. And it's a beautiful fragrance. It's really kind of deep and a little musky and kind of. I don't know. It's yeah, it's lovely. fish sauce. I mean, it's, you know, Southeast Asian cuisine is so popular now. And the reason why people love, you know, Thai and, um, you know, Vietnamese and Cambodian cuisine is because of the use of fish sauce. I mean, it's in, it's in everything. It's sort of, it, it has, it has umami. It has, it's, it's the taste that your body knows that you're uh, getting something that's, that's restorative and good for you. I, I really believe that, that you, you, you have this other sense of taste, um, even beyond umami, that you say that, oh, you know what, this is this is good for me. You know, my body is craving this. Um, so, and it's also the other last good thing about uh, the garum is um, it is sometimes I like to put, you know, things in their natural state in your face and sort of say, like, eat this. This is what it looks like. What's nice is when it's all said and done, it's a crystal clear you know, um, burnished mahogany color, and you don't see the guts, and you know it's it's it's, uh, it's pristine. Yeah, I would say on a shelf you might mistake it for a little bit of you know New York State maple syrup. Yeah, exactly. Or something. Um, speaking of you know perspective and and Asia, I mean, you know, I think um, when you're talking about meat in America, we are often very judgmental of what all other cultures um, choose choose to see as food, you know, dogs and dogs in China come to mind. And I know uh, recently in Brooklyn, we had this big food festival called Guga Muga and uh, the restaurant M. Wells actually was serving horse and horse meat at, at the festival and caused quite a stir. And I'm just wondering, Jackson, if you can and maybe comment on where some of that those hangups are coming from and what we can do to get rid of them. Yeah, well, you know, with regard to horses, um, 
there are invasive populations of wild horses uh, in North America, uh, some quite close to, to my, uh, me and my home in, in, uh, in Virginia. And I kind of thought about, well, you know, should we, should I include this? But I just thought, I don't want to, I don't want to shoot a horse. I don't, I don't want to eat one. I, I think, um, you know, in, in um, Western cultures, you know, we sort of have a deal with with uh, dogs and horses they've been a big help to us we've worked side by side with them you know they kind of we owe a lot of our advancement uh as a civilization to them and we sort of have a deal with horses um that maybe in other cultures they don't have that same deal they don't feel the same way so you know i don't want to eat a dog i don't want to see someone else do it but i'm not going to make a judgment about them as a human being because they decide to do that you know in a, in a different culture but as other than outside of horses and dogs i think where we do have this you know very deep taboo yeah there's a lot of stuff that they eat in asia where it really is just a question of um we get so focused on what the thing looks like before it's cooked you know and we kind of get away from what it you know what what it what it might taste like when you actually eat it like uh, just last night Matt and I, um, we, we put on a dinner together um, serving up um, recipes from his book, From Preserving the Wild, and um, he also incorporated a lot of uh, the invasive species uh, that I cover in my book, Eating Aliens. And, you know, I mean, there, we, we served snakehead, actually, which is this fish that, you know, a lot of people have heard about as, like, they call it the frankenfish, and people are, they, it's a very scary-looking fish. I mean, it's got these sharp teeth that looks very predatory. Its its color is like a, uh, like a copperhead snake, actually, and it's a creepy-looking fish. Uh, but when we actually put it in people's mouths, you know, at this dinner, everyone thought it tasted just like swordfish. It was delicious. You know, they ate all of it. Once they at, once they had a chance to actually eat it, you know, their minds were, were completely changed. Uh, and maybe it's just a question of somebody being open minded enough or put in a socially awkward enough situation where they have to they have to eat it or look ridiculous. I don't know if that's what it takes, but I have seen, you know, in person many times, you know, people's minds change when they actually eat this stuff. Sure. I think it, it also kind of speaks to kind of our general disconnection with how food is is actually produced i mean you go to the grocery store and you pick up your carton of milk and there's a happy pastoral cow on the outside of it but that's really almost 99 percent of the time not at all what that cow looks like or how it's living and and it, it's weird that we have this kind of double standard where we're willing to kind of ignore on one hand and and refuse on the other um, well, we are almost out of time, but before before we wrap up, I did want to kind of ask you guys all your the desert island question. So, drawing from uh, your books, you know, if you're trapped on a desert island. Like, what's the one pickle or, or cured meat, or what's the wild game that you're you're taking with you, and why? Oh my god, if I'm trapped on a desert, so what's growing on that desert island? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's 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 it really is what's whatever's there. I mean, my my uh, my take would be that just go out. Um, look around if you can bring some books with you. It's great. <laughs> if not, just take little little tiny bites of whatever it is and 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 see if they're they're tasty and and they don't have toxicity to it. But I mean, really, just look around you. I mean, there's so much great uh, wild food that's that's growing amongst us. I mean, that is how we have lived, uh, and I and I and I think that everybody would enjoy um, getting into these recipes and and. Um, and doing that some more. I don't know what's your what's your desert island rock out? I don't know. I'm sure you could confit something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we could turn something into riet. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. If not each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd bring a little. Uh, I think I'd bring um, uh, kudzu, which tastes okay. But the point is that I could just plant a little bit, and you know, a few months, the whole island would be covered with it, and I definitely wouldn't starve. What is that? Kudzu. It's yeah. a. It's a. It's a vine that it's. Uh, you don't have it as much up here. It's sort of taken over a lot of the south. You see it growing by the side of the road and just engulfing entire forests. Uh, you can make great dolmas with it. You can use. Um, you, you can use the the tips in uh, in salads. I've made pesto with it. It's delicious. Awesome. So I know if I go down to my uh, local bookstore or pop onto Amazon, I I can't get your books quite yet. But when will uh, when will we be able to see them? And where should we look for them? Uh, Preserving the Wild is coming out October 13th. Uh, it's available right now for pre-order on Amazon. And, uh, you know, I would say it's going to be in uh, all your regular cookbook stores in the uh, re- regular bookstores in your cookbook section, but also in other kind of outdoorsy type uh, venues and, you know, hopefully some some hunting stores and some uh, nurseries for, for gardening just to sort of uh, 
anywhere you're going to find some other great stuff about nature i hope you're going to find my book as well our book as well awesome looking forward how about you jackson uh eating aliens uh you can go online to amazon or barnes and noble or sites like that and and order it for pre and click to pre-order right now um it will be uh, shipping the last week of uh, september maybe early august it will um, hit bookstores and of course my uh my previous book the beginner's guide to hunting deer for food is in bookstores and available online right now Awesome. So there we go. I think all of my holiday shopping is taken care of. Um, Guys, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, You've been listening to the Heritage Radio Network. And tune in next week for another episode of The Farm Report. Thanks for listening to this program on the Heritage Radio Network. You can find all of our archived programs on heritageradionetwork.com, as well as a schedule of upcoming live shows. You can also podcast all of our programs on iTunes by searching Heritage Radio Network in the iTunes Store. You can find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for up-to-date news and information. Thanks for listening.